We'll talk a little bit about that today. There's sometimes that things look the same, like an alligator and a crocodile look the same, but they're very different. An alligator, he might put up with you, but a crocodile is not going to put up with you. Very different. Very different. And so even if you, when you go to the zoo, the, the, the alligators will be maybe a little bit closer to you and not as many fences, but a crocodile is going to be very far from you. It's a different kind of threat when you have a, a crocodile. Look the same. There's a big difference between an ocean and a lake. So I grew up by Lake Michigan, and some of us in Chicago actually saw it. We took a little boat ride, and, and I love Lake Michigan. I grew up by it. It's fresh water. Uh, you could actually literally get in, 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 in Lake Michigan, and you could, if you're, if you're thirsty, and you're really thirsty, you can drink the water. It's fresh water. It's very different. There's certain fish that, that can exist in a lake who can't exist in an ocean because it's salt water. There's certain fish and plants that can't exist in a lake, but they can exist in an ocean. So they look the same. You take a picture, you really can't tell the difference, but they're very, very different. There's a difference between a frog and a toad. Look the same, but they're different. A moth and a butterfly trying to take you guys somewhere. And, and so know that they may, things sometimes look very similar, but they're very different. And so what I want to talk about today is you can, you can plant something, or you can bury something. It's very different. Looks the same. They both go in the ground, but they both have a very different intention or purpose. Y'all already with me? All right, I need you to stay with me for about the next 45 hours. Uh, actually, probably the next 20 minutes, 25 minutes. So when you bury something, you, you, you bury something sometimes because it's the last resting place. Not to be uncovered again. You bury it. You leave it there. You're not going to uncover it. You bury something sometimes because you don't want anybody to find it. So sometimes we bury something because we're trying to hide it. How many know that we can bury some things not just in the soil but in our hearts? So sometimes we bury some things. We don't want anybody to see it. Sometimes we bury something because we're afraid someone might take it. So we bury it. And many times we bury some things because we're afraid we might lose it. Has anybody ever buried something? Yeah. Many times we bury some things because they're dead. Now, when we plant something, it looks very similar. We, we, we have to dig in the ground to plant it, but it has a very different intention. I, instead of trying to, to bury something because it's its last resting place, we're burying it because we believe that there's a new beginning coming. So you bury a seed, not so it would never come up, but so that it would grow. It's a new beginning. You, you plant things that you're not afraid or you're not threatened that someone's going to see it. You can plant something because you expect you, you plant something with an expectation that something is going to grow from that seed that you're planting. So we plant because we want multiplication, because we want to see fruit come from it. You know, my dad would plant every year. and we, had a, we, we grew up in Chicago in the inner city, but he had a little plot of ground, really, really small, maybe not even a quarter of this. And he would plant tomatoes and peppers and, and, and beans, and, and he was so uh, proud of his little garden. And every year we would see beans sprout up and it was crazy because we had this fence and he would plant there was only a little bit of dirt and he would plant beans but the beans would grow and they would grow right through the fence and we would pick the beans and and we would have fresh beans and I don't understand that he just liked to do it it was a hobby and he would force us to go out there and, and peel the beans but when he planted that there was a great expectation and so I want you to understand that as we are living life, we're doing, two of two th we're doing two things. We're either planting things or we're either burying things. And today I want to really encourage you. I want to encourage you and challenge you to not just bury some things, but to start planting some things. In fact, God says that you were born and created to do that. The first book of the Bible, Genesis, in the first chapter, at the end of that chapter, God gives a command to his creation, uh, humanity. He speaks to humanity and he tells uh, Adam and Eve, he says, be fruitful and multiply. 
And last week, we talked a little bit about the kingdom of darkness, and I always refer to maybe this side of the stage as the kingdom of, of darkness, darkness, and this side of the stage as the kingdom of heaven on earth. So Jesus came to reveal heaven on earth. Jesus talks about the kingdom of God more than anything else when, during his life here. And so the kingdom of darkness just wants you to bury some stuff. Just bury it. Just get rid of it. Just forget it ever happened. When the kingdom of heaven says, no, no, it's not good to just forget it. It's good to uncover it and let me do something with it. Y'all with me? All right. All right. So today we want to talk about that. We want to talk about instead of hiding some stuff, let's, let's show it and see God multiply it. Let's see God bring some life out of some things that the world has declared dead. There's some people in the room like that who the world declared dead. But I see them multiplying. And I know there's more of you in here. That God has commanded you. He's not asking. He's commanded you to multiply. We want to talk about that today. If, if I asked you, before we jump in, if I asked you to describe uh, uh, this word using another word, your chance. And I know Yvette, you could be last. Because Yvette's smart. Word or define it with one word. Uh, what would you say if I say define the word faithful? What comes to mind if you, someone is faithful? Okay, bet you can jump in. <laughs> what did you say? Loyal, Loyal. very good. Mo what else? Committed. committed. Okay, so those are good. Those committed, loyal. Y'all, y'all beat me. Consistent. So if you look at the at the dictionary. I didn't get to you, Yvette, but we'll, there, there's room for you. All right. If we look at the, the dictionary the, and, or a thesaurus, the thesaurus, I can't really pronounce it well, but it's really a book that kind of, you could online it too, but you can put a word in it and it gives you words that are very similar or words that can be opposites, synonyms, synonyms or antonyms. I was good at English for a while. But it says, I looked it up, consistent, loyal, obedient, dependable, trustworthy, committed, or having a level of commitment. But, but I want to add another one today. When we look at the word faithful and we want to say it's multiplication. Multiplication. Faithful equals multiplication. And, and, and there, it even goes beyond that. What does the word faithful have in it? It means what? Full of. And faith does what? It pleases God. So, so God has called us. To be full of faith, and that means that as we're being living lives that are full of faith, it means that multiplication should be happening through our lives. Things should multiply when they flow through your life. Your talent, your treasure, your time, it should multiply when we're being faithful to God. There should be multiplication happening. Pastor David and Pastor Samantha, they beat me to it. They jump through it. So let's jump right to the, the Word of God in the book of Matthew. It'll be up there. Let's just put it up there. Matthew. And, and Jesus, a lot of times, he comes to, he comes to uncover. He comes to, to bring life to the kingdom of heaven on earth. And, and he died on the cross not just so we would have eternal life, not just so we would be saved. And those are some really amazing things that I'm so thankful that he came and gave his life so that I would have salvation. But he also came so that we, through his death and his resurrection, you and I would bring his kingdom down here to Philadelphia. That means things that were dark should now be bright. Things that were dead should now come alive. And it's supposed to happen through his church. It's supposed to happen through his church. And you and I, when we give our lives to Jesus and we, we become part of the church, his bride, he's the groom, we're the bride. And so as we're waiting for the groom to come back, because he's coming back, we are to expand his kingdom. That, that is the purpose of the church. That is the purpose of my life. It is the purpose of your life that we would expand the kingdom. The kingdom means that there's some good things in store. The kingdom means that there's some things that need to be planted, and he wants to multiply them. Over here in darkness, it's about negativity. It is about subtraction and addition. God is too big to get stuck in subtraction and addition. So he's a multiplying God. So he created you to multiply whatever he puts in your hand. 
So it says here, and Jesus describes the kingdom of God in many different ways. If we look at it, the way he, he described a lot of, uh, in his parables or his stories, he said, the kingdom of God is like, it's like a mustard seed. It's like a treasure hidden in a field. It is, a, it is like a man who sowed good seed, and, and there's about 10 or uh, 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 different ways that he describes the kingdom. And he uses these parables, these stories. So this is one of the stories that we want to share in Matthew 25, and it says this. It says, I want to read it from the screen. I have it here. but It says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Then he left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give account of what they had used, of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five to invest. I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful, faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest. I've earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So I will give you many more responsibilities. Let us celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, master, I knew you were a harsh man. Harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid. I was afraid I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here's the money back. But the master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. If you knew I had harvested plant crops, I didn't plant and gather crops, I didn't cultivate. Why didn't you then deposit my money in the bank? At least you would have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant, give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing... Even what little they will have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Perhaps you've heard the story before. Perhaps you haven't. I just want to share it. And I want to give you an illustration. So I have three servants about to run up here at some point. They should be running. They should be running. Because I want to bless them. I want to bless them. And I want to give them an opportunity. So we have one servant here. Tall, smart, wise. I'm going to get one, two, three, four, five. Go and multiply this. I'm about to go on a trip. No, not to Chicago. (laughs) The Maldives. All right. My second servant. Faithful. I entrust you with one. Go and multiply it. And then the last servant. I trust you. Go multiply it. So they go. Some time goes by. The master goes on this amazing trip. Amazing trip. Traveling the world. Where are we going, honey? The Maldives. I don't know if it's pronounced that way, but we're going to Maldives. We go. And then we come back. And I'm looking for my servants. All right, so the servants come back, and they got to give a count. So I'm, gonna wait, I'm waiting at the table. I'm waiting for the servants to come back. <sighs> See if they multiplied it. So the first servant comes according to the Bible. Say, Eric... I gave you five. Put down what you got. Double it. Wow. Praise the Lord. 
Let's make sure it's true. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I trust you so much. Go ahead, take this, take this, and put it in my safe. So he takes it. Second servant, Ivan, how'd you do? What'd you do? Doubled it. Praise the Lord. All right. Go double it again. Then I bring the last one, last servant. He's, gonna, he's a little late to the table, waiting for him, waiting for him, waiting for him. What'd you do? He buried it. Why did you bury it? Because I'm a harsh man. Because I'm a harsh man. So I say, get out of my sight. Go. And I take his, and I say, Eric, come back. Here. The one servant couldn't, I couldn't trust him. He didn't, he didn't know who I really am. Here you go. I trust you. What happened there? A bunch of things happened, but one thing happened was there was a lack of relationship happening. See, the last servant, Alfredo, he didn't understand that. He was afraid. He was afraid. He thought I was after him. He thought I was going to punish him. If he would have even lost it, but he was trying to, he wouldn't have got condemned. But there was a lack of relationship. And there's some moments in our lives that we are not multiplying things because we don't understand who God is. Because there's no relationship. And so we look at God as this person just waiting in heaven to just beat us up, to just beat us up. Has anybody ever believed that? I, I believed it all my life, mostly that God was just waiting to just see me mess up once again so he could just grab the hammer and just say, boom, boom. But that's not who God is. He's a good master. He's a, he's a good God. And, and he'll double your efforts when you do it with the right heart. And so I want to take you somewhere today. I, I want to take you that to, to a place where, where, where this story that Jesus shares, he's trying to teach the people what the kingdom of God is like. He wants to, them to, to buy into the kingdom of God. So there's these three unique relationships he has. The Bible says that, that each one had a different level of ability, a different type of talent. I don't have the same abilities that, I don't know, that Tim has. He has different abilities. I don't have the same abilities that Brother Juan has. I'm not supposed to have the same abilities. I'm not supposed to have, have the same talent. I'm uniquely made. My purpose is different than anybody else's purpose. You're not supposed to be me. I'm not supposed to be you, but there's some gifts and some talents God has placed in me. He has placed in you. And when you get to know who he is, you begin to understand, oh, hold up, there's some things in me that are not like everybody else. There's some unique things. In the end, all of the talents are, were created and placed inside of us so we would expand his kingdom. But my purpose doesn't look like your purpose, nor should it. Sometimes they look similar, but they're not the same. Your purpose is like your fingerprint. No one can take your purpose. You know, sometimes we're fighting for the same chair when no one fits in your chair. You don't need somebody else's chair. You can look at their chair and say, well, that's a great chair. But don't try to take their chair. Just, just find yours. And so there's talents that God has placed in you that I don't need, that I, I, don't, I don't need your talent. You need to discover your talent. You need to multiply that thing that he already placed inside of you. And then you say, yeah, yeah, God used, why, why does Jesus use bags of silver? He uses silver because God understands what money means to us. You know, and, and sometimes people say, well, you come to church, they just want your money. Has anybody ever heard that? Don't lie. Y'all know, y'all know have heard that. First of all, I want to say that man did not create money. God created money. Money is a God idea. It's not a man idea. And why did God create money? Because trading didn't start in Wall Street. It started in heaven. Trading of worship. 
training started in heaven. And so what manifests in heaven manifests in the spiritual realm, and then we see it here on earth. So money is not a man idea. It is not a Wall Street idea. It is a God idea. And God created money because he knew that money would reflect your, the level of trust you have in him. He created money because he knew that, what, that if we began to fall in love with it, it would be the root of all evil. So, so money has a bigger concept than just paying bills or just filling a bank account. Money is in direct relation to your heart. God's not after your money. He's after your heart. And he uses money sometimes to test your heart. That's why Jesus uses silver because he knows how important that is to the people when he's talking to them. He knows that when, they, when people talk about money that he gets their attention. But God is never after your money. He's after your heart because he already owns all of the money. He created it. Whatever money we make is n not even ours. It's, it's all his. But since money deals with the heart, Jesus uses it. He created finances. And I want to apologize. I just want to apologize here today because I know that the church or many churches have abused, have abused money. And so on behalf of all the churches that missed it, all the churches that messed up, all the churches that, that manipulated people for personal gain or to, for personal uh, 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 profit or whatever, I just apologize. I just repent on behalf of them. You know, if many, the people who have done that didn't start off with that ambition. They just fell into it. So I just apologize to those who have been hurt, myself included. So Jesus uses this parable because he knows, he knows that our heart reflects, is reflected through our, our management of our money, which in the end is his. So the master gives him five bags of silver. He doubles it and let's celebrate. There's a party. The second silver, the second servant, two bags, he doubles it. Let's celebrate together. And then the third one says, man, I knew you were harsh, man. I, I, I just, I was afraid. I was afraid. He says it there. He says, I was afraid. I was afraid. And so fear keeps us from multiplying some things. And you know what that third guy did? He didn't lose it. He didn't lose it. He didn't misuse it. He hid it. He just maintained it. I'm going somewhere. He just maintained it. And that tells me that maintaining is a sin. So sometimes we maintain some stuff we think it's good. In fact, we celebrate people who maintain stuff because they didn't lose it, didn't misuse it, and it's still there. And we said, wow, that person, they're, they're doing great. They, can, they are good stewards. When they're not really stewards, they're being sinful because they're not willing to move in faith, full of faith, to multiply what they think is okay to maintain. He didn't give you that talent so you would maintain it. He didn't fill up your wallet so you would maintain it. He gave it to you. He entrusted you so you would multiply that thing. It is about multiplication, church. It is about multiplication, and that means that we have to take some risk in this. That means we have to, we have to risk some stuff. We have, to, we have to believe that he is who he says he is. And so if we're just maintaining, we're sinning. And what happened to that servant? He said he got kicked out. They took his gift, and they gave it to the one who was multiplying. I don't want to lose my gift. I don't want to give up my gift to nobody else in this room. It's my gift. It's my job to multiply it. I hope and pray you will begin to feel the same way. That whatever gift you have, you wouldn't maintain it. You would lay it out on there on the table. Say, I'm going to risk it because I know it's not mine in the first place. I'm going to lay it out there because I know that I was created to multiply it. I was commanded to have dominion here on earth to reign. And so I have to put some stuff on the table and I got to take a risk and I do it full of Faith. Genesis chapter 1 says, then God blessed them. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. He blessed them. He says what? Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea. 
the birds in the sky and the animals that scurry along the ground. He says, reign over it. Reign. Take dominion. You have spiritual authority. What comes out of your mouth matters. How you talk to people matters. How you, how you, how you interact with God matter, matters. Just like the guy, he said, you're harsh. You're, and God says, no, I'm not. You got it all twisted. And because you just maintain, you got to go. I didn't create you to maintain. I created you to multiply. That means you have to, you have to move in faith. You have to believe that I am good. You have to believe that I am for you. You have to take a risk and lay some things at the table. And I'll tell you, when you lay them on the table, he'll show you how to multiply it. You don't have to figure it out. You just need a God idea. Anybody in the house need a God idea? I know I could use a God idea. I know I'm supposed to multiply. God, how am I supposed to do it? Uh, your idea, your plan, your strategy, because mine is too small. I feel faith rising in the room. Don't misuse what he gave you. Don't mis maintain it, church. It's sinful. It calls them wicked. It calls them lazy. I want you to know something that you may not have heard before. I've been in church for 50 years, and I just heard this when I went to Israel. I shared it a few times here, but I'm going to share it again. The earth, you were not, let me, let me say this. The earth was made for you. You were, not, you were not made or created for the earth. That's the way we've been taught, that we're here to, no, 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 no. It was it was created for you to govern it, for you to dom dominate it. When you, you begin to think that, hold up, I'm not just here because. I'm here because there's purpose in me. God told me that I'm supposed to govern. He said I'm supposed to reign. That means that what comes out of my mouth, I have authority over some things. So when things are out of order, I can, I can declare them back in order. That when someone comes and does something to, to me in a bad way or says something to me in a negative fashion or, or declares that something over me that is not true, I say, I do not receive that. You have that right. Don't laugh it off. Don't laugh it off. Don't laugh it off. Don't chuckle it away when someone says, man, you ain't worth nothing. Oh, ho, 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 hold up. I don't receive that word. Let it not come out of your mouth again, because I was fearfully made, wonderfully made. But you got to declare it. Don't receive those words that people, you're lazy, you ain't worth, no, no, I'm not. I might have used to be, but that's not me. I am, when I, when, when I have a responsibility, I am there. My yes is yes, and my no is no. Church, your actions better reflect what comes out of your mouth as well. If they say you're lazy, then say, hold up, what areas am I being lazy in? There, there's a season you could be shy, okay. But man, you can't be shy forever. I'm just not nobody. God created the earth for me. I have a purpose here. And I'm going to discover what that purpose is. I'm going to live it out. I'm going to live out my destiny. I'm going to leave a legacy. And you know what people are going to remember? They're going to remember his name through my life. It's created for you. For you. For you. Can we stand up in this place today? Wow, wow. I just sense right now that some maintainers are being woken up saying, oh, I'm not going to maintain no more. I'm not going to be the status quo. I'm not going to say who other, I'm not going to live out other people's plan for my life. I'm going to live out God's plan. Can we just close our eyes all over the room? Heavenly Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we take spiritual authority right now, God. All the lies, Lord, all the garbage, Lord, that we have received, Lord, and we have buried in our hearts, God. Other people's opinion and not your opinion, God.
God, that we will begin to get to know who you are, God, a good father. I pray you would begin, Holy Spirit, to uncover those buried things, those things we just maintain, God. Whether it's our money, whether it's our talent, whether it's our life, whether it's our plan, whether it's our strategy, God. We would uncover them. Holy Spirit, you begin to uncover those things, lay them on the table, begin to multiply the gifts. Multiply. Multiply, Lord. Multiply. Multiply. I pray God right now for God ideas all over the room, Holy Spirit of God over your children so we can have dominion so we would talk different so we would act different so we would walk different so when we walk in the room God we, people would understand hold, hold up this is a person of authority this is a person this is a man this is a woman of authority so I come against that spirit of maintaining that's full of fear lack of faith right now in the name of Jesus and I pray faith would arise right now. Trust in God. He is for you. He's unstoppable. And he's good. With every eye closed, if you know he's calling you to step out today. If you're tired of maintaining and you're ready to step towards him. You're ready to multiply the gifts that he's placed in your hands and in your heart. I just challenge you right now challenge you. I'm going to count to three, and if you know that's you, you're just going to raise your hand. One, two, three, if that's you. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, God, for those brave people. 